All right, so we're looking to continue and hopefully in this video finish our discussion on inference for least squares regression. So chapter 12 is all about how you conduct confidence intervals and significance tests on a line of best fits. Now, last video, I justified why that would be a helpful thing to do. And we talked about how really what we care about is analyzing that slope beta, the true slope of our regression line. Now, the context for this problem here that we're starting with, we're just jumping in with a four step. And this should look a little familiar because we did do a problem on this, I believe, back in chapter three. But we're looking at the amount of sugar placed into a vase with water and how many hours the flowers stay fresh for. And what we want to do for our four step here is construct and interpret a 99% confidence interval for the slope of the true regression line. Remember that the variable we use for this is going to be beta. It's like a Greek letter B because we use B to represent slope in statistics. And we want to know the true slope of our line because if that slope is a positive number versus a negative number, that tells us something about the relationship between our two variables. So thinking about our four steps here, when we start out, we do our state step. Four steps for confidence intervals don't usually have hypotheses. So what I would be saying for this would be something to the effect of that we want to estimate at a 99% confidence level, beta, which is going to be the true slope of our regression line relating in this problem, hours of freshness to the sugar. We want to estimate that with a 99% confidence interval. So I'm going to go ahead and pause and put that up there all nice for you guys. Boom, so we got ourselves a nice little script here for our introduction or our state step. We want to estimate this beta to the true slope of our regression line. Um, and we're making sure we mention context in doing so. It's the least squares regression line that relates our y, hours of freshness, to x, which is the sugar tablespoons. And make sure you mention your confidence level in this problem, that being the 99%. So after the state step, what we usually would do is we would jump in and check some conditions here. We'd want to make sure everything is satisfied. But as you recall, our list of conditions was kind of crazy. There was a lot going on right here. I do not need you to worry about knowing these conditions. If like in a pure sense, like it'd be nice if you guys knew them, I'm not holding you responsible for them. What we're going to do is say for our condition step, on a linear regression problem, only for this kind. Don't start doing this for like chi-square and other kinds of problems here. We may assume that our conditions are met. So we may assume all conditions are met. Now, sometimes the problem actually does say this. The AP test is like, hey, there's enough going on here. I don't need you guys to know the conditions. I'm just going to say they're met. But sometimes they may make you check them. It's very rare for this to happen. If the problem doesn't actually say conditions are met, like I don't think this one does, we're taking a little bit of an L on this question right here where, oh, we might lose a point for not verifying conditions. Not worth learning them. It's the sort of thing where you're going to say assume conditions are met even if they're not actually met. And that's where we're at on that step. So that should be one thing to make your life a little bit easier here. So then we're ready to actually conduct conduct and ah, construct our confidence interval. When we construct our confidence interval, you always start with your point estimate, which is your statistic, which in this problem is the slope from our sample. Our sample slope, you can get that off of the little computer output right here. They should always give you a computer output on this kind of problem. There is going to be a sample slope of 15.2. So that is where I start my interval. 15.2. That's me in the middle before I reach out my arms both ways to make my confidence interval. And then we're going to add or subtract. It goes critical value times standard deviation or standard error. So I need to do a quick calculation here. In order to get my critical value, I know that the area in the middle is going to be a 0.99. We want a 99% interval. That leaves just a little sliver of 0 0.005 on each side. So I would want to do an inverse T on this one with an area of 0 0.005 
my degrees of freedom for this problem. Remember with two variable problems, LSRL stuff, it's N minus two, sample size minus two, not minus one, like we're used to. There were 12 carnations that were tested. So we have 10 degrees of freedom. That's worth writing down. It's gonna be N minus two for that setup, just so you remember. So if you actually calculate that test, uh, sorry, not test statistic, that critical value here, our T star, it's going to throw back a negative 3.169. We know to make it a positive. So there is going to be our critical value, positive 3.169. And then finally, I would need to multiply by my standard deviation or standard error. You will not be expected to calculate this yourself. It's just grabbing the right number out of the output, which is going to be a 1.943. So if I multiply by that right here, that is the standard error for my slope, same line and everything. And then if you actually do the calculations on this, I'm going to jump to actually saying the interval. It's 9.04 to 21.36. It's a pretty wide interval. But you got to remember that we did do a 99% and 99% is a lot wider than a 95%. So what does this interval do for us? Well, think about it. The slope for the real LSRL is between 9 and 21 in a very general sense. Remember that you would interpret the slope by saying for every one increase in X. So for every one tablespoon increase in sugar, the Y is predicted to increase by whatever your slope is. So the Y, the hours of freshness, are predicted to increase between 9 and 21 um, hours for every tablespoon of sugar you add. In other words, the sugar is definitely doing something here. I, I, I guess I shouldn't make a cause and effect statement. But all of these values are positive. There is very strong evidence that more sugar leads to more freshness in the flowers. Now, of course, there's an upper limit to this. If I dump a tub of sugar in there, it's not gonna like help the flower, it's probably gonna kill the flower. But for at least this zero, one, two, three range, surely it does seem that the more sugar causes, more sugar causes, or again, probably not causes, but is associated with higher levels of freshness. Now I am dancing around the word causes, but as I look at this, it was random assignment here. So it actually would be fair for me to make a causal claim here. I could say that the sugar caused the additional hours of freshness because there was random assignment. Okay. That was a little tangent right there. What I do need to do to finish my four step here is give the little script. We are 99% confident that the true slope of the LSRL relating freshness to sugar is captured by the interval 9.04, this is really sloppy, I apologize, to 21.36. We're 99% confident that the interval from here to here captures the true parameter, or I did it backwards, I said that the parameter is captured by the interval. Either of those is fine, as long as you have your context in the problem. So that's how you would do a four step on the slope of a regression line in terms of making a confidence interval. Now, if they asked, is this convincing evidence that the sugar does something, you'd be like, yeah, all the values are positive. Um, so it does appear that the sugar does cause the um, flowers to stay fresh for longer. So um, you'll notice I kind of used a little formula right here and I grabbed stuff out of the computer output. If they happen to give you a question like this, this is probably how you'll do it. Like I just set it up right here. It is possible to use your calculator for the do step, but it's risky. And I actually, surprisingly, for as much as I'm like, yeah, use the calculator for four steps, this is a situation where you may not want to. So let me show you how this would actually play out if you chose to use your calculator. You would need to go stats, edits, and type your data in. 
So I'm gonna go ahead and pause and pop that in here. All right, so my data is all typed in and ready to go, and I double checked it. Um, this is not super advisable because all it takes is one number that you messed up and boom, everything's wrong. They can't even give you partial credit because they can't see what you did. It's just a big mess if you try typing this in yourself, but you can do it. I took my raw data, I threw it in, I proofed it. Then I'm gonna quit out and go back to our good old test menu like we usually are. And at the very end, there is a linreg t test and a linreg t interval. If I run my linreg interval, which is what I want here, L1 and L2 are where my data is, frequency you leave alone, 99%. Um, you can leave the regression equation blank and hit calculate. You will see, hopefully, to not surprise, not surprising, um, that the interval actually, this is the interval for beta, um, it goes from 9.04 to 21.36, exactly like we did with our formula. This is a situation where it's messy to type it in the calculator. It doesn't, it's probably more time consuming. And you guys already should know this blue stuff right here with how you build a confidence interval. I think it's actually better to do it by semi hand with formula, but the option is yours. If you don't like that, you can throw the data in your calculator and it still does have that capability. So. That is kind of a your decision, but I recommend formula. All right, so the second piece to today's lesson is learning, or this video, is learning how you actually transfer this and do a significance test instead of doing an interval. So when we talk test statistic here, in terms of how you would set up your test statistic, remember that we have a T or a Z or a chi-square test statistic. And I've already kind of spoiled it, that we're back in T territory here. So if you do a test statistic, it will be a T test statistic. And the way that this goes, it goes statistic minus parameter or value minus mean. That's what we usually see up top. Our statistic on a problem like this is what we get from our sample, which is our sample slope B, minus our parameter that we're actually looking for is that beta, but I'm gonna put beta with a zero on it because that is gonna be the beta from your null hypothesis. So you're gonna have an HO and HA when you do those, just like you have, when we would do this with like mu, we'd have mu with a little O on it, just what you get from HO. And we're gonna divide this by the standard deviation and or standard error of our statistic. So this is our basic setup here. This is uh, still gonna be n minus two for the degrees of freedom. And is this formula on the formula sheets? Let me pause and pull that up for you guys. All right, so pulling up my formula sheet here, if you look at the box at the very bottom, so on the second page, they've got a whole section for slope stuff. They do have the standard deviation formula, which I told you to stay away from that. You're not gonna wanna use it. They don't explicitly have the formula on here. For your test statistic. If you look at this box right here, it's just not there. They do have the general test statistic formula, statistic minus parameter over standard error, but not with the actual symbols plugged in. So it's going to be like a case where you can look at that first box and just plug the pieces where they go and do it that way, but not exactly on the formula sheets. And I'm going to go turn my light back on and then we'll do this problem. All right, so let's wrap our head around the context for this problem here. We're doing two context-based problems in one video, which admittedly is a lot. You can always pause it and take a break if you need to. But in this problem, what we're looking at here is the amount of time customers stay at a buffet, which um, timing how long they're in the restaurant here, less of a thing as I'm making this video in 2021, but we can still imagine. And then we've also got the tip that the customers end up leaving in dollars. So does longer time in the buffet lead to a higher tip overall? Kind of a cool project. She's got some data right there. And there's a few review questions that I throw in here. So we've got our computer output. We've got our residual plots. There are these pieces which we've done plenty of times. In the interest of keeping this video relatively short, I'm not gonna explicitly answer these ones here, but these would be good practice questions for you guys to try. And I suppose I can keep the video link the same and just slap answers up here. 
Um, I, I'll go ahead and do that so you guys can at least have them. So you can pause me right here and try them for yourself, and then I'll just pop up the answers and move right on with the video. All right, so I've got answers here. You can pause um, to get them down if you're so interested, if you feel fine with the review stuff from chapter three. No need, but you can at least see what's going on. Biggest thing is making sure that word predicted is in your answers for slope, for y-intercept, for any sort of problem involving regression, your y is predicted. That is a big place kids lose points on the AP test. And the final question, which is on like the next page all by itself here, is to carry out an appropriate test to answer Charlotte's question. Charlotte was interested in if this is convincing evidence that customers who stay longer give larger tips. So I'm actually gonna do this just in the space on this page so I don't have to keep like scrolling up and down here. So it's gonna be like a little bit of a messy four step, but I think you guys will be just fine with that. Um, and what I'm gonna do to start out is define my variable. Beta is gonna be the true slope of the LSRL relating the tip in dollars to time in minutes. It's the true slope of that regression line connecting those two variables. And then what we always do in a significance test problem is we set up our hypotheses as well as our alpha. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw down an alpha equals 0.05 Gets a little confusing because I just told you last video, alpha also means y-intercept, but through context, you can assume that means significance level. Uh, HO, when you do a problem like this, your null hypothesis, just like it was last chapter with chi-square, it says there's no association between these variables. There's nothing going on here. We try to look for evidence that there is. Well, if there was nothing going on here, we would not have a positive or a negative slope between our variables. In other words, beta would be zero. There's no association between our variables. And then our alternative hypothesis. Charlotte thinks that customers who stay longer give larger tips, meaning that our slope would be positive by nature. So when we set this up right here, you would base that on the wording in the problem, just like you would do in a mu problem or a p problem. So we're back to defining in symbols rather than in words like we would do with chi-square. So next up, we have our condition step. We can assume all conditions are met. Um, sometimes, like I said, the problem will actually say that. I don't know if this one does or not. It's not changing what I say. Even if they're not met, I'm just saying they are to save myself time on this. That's just what I want you guys to do as well. Um, I don't think it says they are, so we'd lose a point on that, but such is life, I guess. We're moving on now to our actual step where we conduct our significance test. Now, for our test here, you could throw data in calculator, run a linreg t test. Don't advise it. You can get what you need from the computer output. Everything you need is right here. So, I'm gonna go ahead and name this. It is a linear regression t-test. Technically for beta, if you wanna get real fancy, if you left that out, it's fine. So I named the test. I gotta report my degrees of freedom, just like we would do before. There are, I guess I have to count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 data points. Yes, that means 10 degrees of freedom just like last time, we need to report our test statistic, our T, as well as our p-value. Now here's the exciting part actually. This info is in the computer output. It always has been. But first semester, we didn't know what any of this stuff was right here. We were like, oh, don't need that, scratch it out. Turns out that actually stands for your test statistic and your p-value, which is kind of neat. The stuff that you didn't know when we first learned this, now you do. So you're going to pick the test statistic that is right here based on the same line as your slope. So our test statistic is going to be 1.23 for this problem. Now, there is one curveball with the p-value that you got to be careful about. 
The computer doesn't know. Did you want to do a greater than or a less than or a not equals? So what it does is it always reports a two-sided p-value. So this is always two-sided. That's just what the computer output tends to do. And then from there, you can be like, hey, I, I wanted a one-sided, which just means cut it in half. So what I would need to do for this number right here is actually divide my p-value by two, which is like 0.1235. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause and come back with a conclusion here. I just remember the p-value does need to be cut in half. We will not use the numbers above it. These would be if we wanted to run an inference on the y-intercept, which is a lot less common. We want the ones that are on the same line as your slope. Think about what your conclusion would say here. Pause me, try to get down your own, and I will pause myself and come back with my nice little scripts. All right, writing conclusions should be something you all can do in your sleep. By this point in the class, our p-value is too big. It's greater than alpha even after we cut it, our p-value in half. We're gonna fail to reject HO. There is not strong enough evidence. There's not convincing evidence that customers who stay longer leave larger tips. You can see in the data, there is a slight positive trend, but that trend is so slight that if we picked another random sample, ugh, would it still be positive? You can't say for sure. You switch up one or two of these dots and you could be looking at a complete no correlation or a negative, I guess, always mess that up, it's mirrored here, a negative correlation. So when we do these, basically, the evidence in this problem just wasn't strong enough. The data wasn't clear enough to say, yes, customers who stay longer in like the population would leave longer tips. So you are doing a four step, but you're extracting the pieces from the computer output. Hopefully it makes sense how I set that up there. You can do it in the calculator, but with these kind of problems, it's actually not the best option. So just basically doing a four step like you guys already understand, and that is section 12.1. 12.2 gets into something called transforming data, which I'll do with you guys through a practice investigation in class one day. But in terms of what do I need to know how to do in chapter 12, you need to be able to know how to do stuff for beta, for the slope. You gotta be able to do a confidence interval and a significance test. Four step style, we covered both of those in this video.